Thanks for joining us today. We're here to talk about San Jose's commercial linkage fee in this, our July hack. For those of you not familiar with the hack, this is our monthly uh, last Friday of the month. Well, usually this is the fourth Friday, uh, fourth or last Friday of the month event uh, where we do some discussion and talk about current things that are going on in housing policy around Santa Clara County. So this month we're talking about the commercial linkage fee. Next month we'll be talking about uh, Prop 15, Schools and Communities First, which is a big ballot measure that will raise a large amount of money um, for schools, communities, some affordable housing. And we'll talk about how Prop 15 relates to affordable housing specifically. Um, but for today, we're trying out something new. Since this is only our third hack since the beginning of COVID, we're using the Zoom webinar feature and we're doing questions through Q&A feature. So you'll see a survey after this as well, where you can let us know what you think about that and other aspects of today's hack. So how can we raise $50 million a year plus for affordable housing in San Jose? Uh, today we're gonna be joined by San Jose City Councilor Raul Perales and Nadia Aziz from the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley to discuss San Jose's proposed commercial linkage fee. Commercial linkage fees are collected when developers build commercial real estate for businesses that uh, often pay employees less than they need to afford housing in San Jose. And that uh, fund, those funds are used to build some of that affordable housing to meet that new demand. Uh, so we'll hear a bit later from Nadia Aziz, directing attorney at the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley and uh, Councilmember Raul Perales, the Councilmember from San Jose's District 3, which includes downtown. But first, SB at Home's own policy manager, Matthew Reed, will start us off with some background. Matthew? You did. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Mitch, for, for kicking this off. Um, these, these hacks are a really important part of our uh, ability to, to reach out to folks and to, to, to get some some feedback and questions, and we're really pleased to be talking about the commercial linkage fee process today. Um, I'm going to start off because there have been a lot of questions, um, doing a quick overview of, of the process and, and what some of the studies and the documents mean. I'm going to do it quickly, but if there are questions, we can come back to it um, during the Q&A session. So, First of all, what is a commercial linkage fee? As Mitch explained, uh, it's a standard tool that's used um, around the state and in the county um, to generate funding for affordable housing. Um, commercial developers pay a small fee to help to mitigate the additional demand for affordable housing that is created by uh, their, their development. Um, San Jose is the only major city in the county that doesn't have a fee. So the, the process um, is, is a relatively complicated one. Um, a lot of cities have gone through it in the last couple of years. This is a, uh, a table that just shows what the fee levels were in the, in the past year um, in some of the neighboring jurisdictions in the, uh, in the county. Again, you'll note that San Jose is conspicuously missing from the from the list. So the, the, first, uh, the first thing that has happened uh, as we get the run up to the vote uh, at the end of August is that there was a release of uh, a nexus study, um, which is a legally required document. Uh, it's required by the state mitigation fee laws. Um, it's prepared by an outside consultant in coordination with staff. And it looks at eight different types of commercial development um, and, and calculates how many employees per square foot and different types of business activities there are, um, what those jobs are and uh, what the different wage levels are for some of those employees. Um, it, it, it doesn't have a tremendous impact on the eventual decisions that councils tend to make on these, but in some ways it's like an autopsy um, on our housing crisis and the impact of uh, jobs when we don't provide housing. If you could go to the next slide. So the study starts with um, salary levels, but then moves up to analyze uh, the actual impact impact at the household level 
Um, and and what, what this is out of the Nexus study that came out last week, um, what it shows is that there are significant uh, numbers of workers who are employed even in, in you know, high tech office settings um, who, whose households don't necessarily earn enough to be able to afford uh, that, that, the high housing costs in San Jose. We could go to the next slide. Um, so through the technical process, we come up with this table, which lists by the type of development or the, the, the type of business, what the maximum fee uh, that is allowable by law um, will be to, to mitigate the, the full impacts of the increased demand for affordable housing um, created by new development. Um, again, this is the maximum allowable um, as you saw earlier, the, the fee levels never reach these levels of full mitigation, but it provides, we think, important um, context for the discussion that is, is to follow. Next slide. So the next, um, the next study that we're expecting today um, is the feasibility study. This is also being prepared by an outside consultant uh, in coordination with city staff. It is not required by law, uh, but it was requested by city council. And this is a, a kind of a technical overview of what the impact of fees at different levels would be on the ability for projects to be feasible in the city of San Jose. Um, it uses different types of development, different different types of jobs producing uses like the Nexus study, but it also is expected to include different geographies. There will be a different analysis for downtown, for North San Jose and other parts of the city. This should present fee options um, and explain how they are sensitive to market conditions. Um, this was going to be a complicated study uh, when, when it was begun in, in the best of times, and it's an even more complicated study now, but there's a recognition that even prior to the current crisis, um, there were a lot of assumptions that were going to have to be made. And so the expectation was that they would be transparent. It would be laid out in a way that council could have a, a you know, a reasoned policy discussion that was grounded in data. Okay, next slide. Um, so the feasibility study hasn't come out. We're expecting it later this afternoon. Um, and I just wanted to draw attention to some of the, the things that we were looking at. Um, the original study was completed in February and it, there, there, things have changed. And so it has been updated um, in light of the pandemic and, and the economic recession. This is a very, I think everybody acknowledges, this is a very difficult time to assess the future of community de uh, commercial development in the city. Um, there's a, a tremendous amount that we don't know about what things are gonna look like two to five years out um, and, and beyond uh, when the projects that are currently being considered um, will actually go onto the market. Um, we expect there to be significant additions and new assumptions since, since uh, the update. Um, and we, we're, we're watching carefully to uh, see what those assumptions are and how, how they're assessing the current environment because it's gonna have a tremendous impact on both the discussion and, and the, the, the fee levels that uh, are gonna be recommended by the study. Um, I think a core question for us is that in this period of uncertainty is the need to mitigate affordable housing impacts what is holding up development. It's clearly a difficult time. Um, the goal of the study is to analyze the feasibility of different projects going forward um, and the impact that specific fee levels will have on their viability. Next slide. Uh, just for a little context, and then I'm done. Uh, in 2019, uh, we gave building permits to 3.9 million square feet of new commercial development. That's up to 11,000 workers. And we didn't 
collect any fees for affordable housing, so the demand is going to be increasing. Um, as of March of this year, there were 38 million square feet of of developments that were in various stages of the process, and that, that's up to 125,000 new jobs. So we don't know what's gonna happen exactly going forward, but there's, as everybody knows, there was tremendous momentum. Um, over the next 10 years, we think that every dollar difference in the fee level um, could equal or be greater than our annual uh, production right now for affordable housing in the city. So we believe this is an extremely consequential uh, discussion. Um, and, and, you know, we're hoping that everybody can plug in and get involved. So ne next slide, please. Um, I want to introduce Nadia Aziz from the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. Um, the Law Foundation has been really an important part of the, the group and the, the effort to keep this moving uh, over the last couple of years. And I'm really pleased that she's uh, been able to join us today. And I will turn it over to Nadia. Thanks, Nadia. Thanks, Matthew. And thank you, Silicon Valley at Home, for organizing this and inviting um, me to speak on behalf of the Law Foundation and behalf of our clients. Um, like Matthew said, the Law Foundation uh, provides free legal services um, and one of the areas that we provide services on is housing. Um, last fiscal year, which was between um, July of last year and June of this year, we served 4,700 people with a, uh, with a housing issue that was about uh, uh, 14, uh, it's about 1,800 cases. And then the vast majority of those were people either facing eviction or, or fearing displacement. And so it's through that lens that, we're, that I'm looking at and thinking about the why, about why we, we need a commercial linkage fee. Um, so from our perspective, this is not a matter of housing versus jobs. A healthy city needs both. Um, this is a matter of equity in that, in the, with a belief that everybody should, be have, should have a home. And that's why we think strong and healthy cities should have a robust commercial linkage fee. And we always, we hear a lot in San Jose about us having an inverse jobs housing balance, um, that we have more jobs than housing, or I'm sorry, that we have more housing than we have jobs. Um, and that's why we're, you know, the city is focused on development, but like, but just like all jobs are not alike, not all housing is alike. And so um, it's clear that we may have many, we might have many high paying jobs, but we have a dangerously low level of affordable homes um, and homes that are affordable to people who are lower um, middle, even middle uh, income. So in looking at the commercial linkage, linkage fee, um, when a developer builds new commercial office building, it creates an increased need uh, for housing, particularly for employees and contractors. And if that housing um, is, not, is not being built, it has a negative impact on surrounding communities. Um, when the demand for housing increases, so does the cost of housing, um, pricing residents out who are facing displacement or who already live there. Um, in our experience, and I think the data shows this, this is overwhelmingly people of color. Um, and, you know, we're at a very important moment, like in our country, in our city, in our community, where people are, are talking about racial justice and racial equity. Um, it's overwhelmingly people of color who are being impacted by COVID and who are being impacted by the housing crisis. Um, that's a matter, uh, and the two are related, right? Um, it's essential workers who are being forced to, to go out there who are facing the health disparities, but it's also people of color, primarily Latinx um, people in, in San Jose, in the east side of San Jose, that are being hit hardest um, with the housing crisis, who are facing um, displacement and eviction, and who are facing um, the choice of whether to move from this community, community some families have been in for generations, or um, whether to, whether to, um, you know, um, become homeless or, or, or think about other, um, or move into a smaller uh, overcrowded condition. Our displaced neighbors also carry the additional financial and time burdens of longer commutes, less time with families, and greater exposure to health, health risks. The commercial linkage fee is meant to help alleviate these problems. Um, 
the city charges a developer fee, the city uses a fee to build more affordable housing um, developers. You know, we talk a lot about sustainability when we talk about the commercial link with linkage fee. And, you know, is this going to be sustainable for developers? But we really think that we should also be thinking about sustainability for our community. Um, is the fee going to be high enough to sustain enough affordable housing that's needed to mitigate um, some of the negative aspects of the of the development? And this is even more important um, in this in this time we're living now of COVID. Um, sorry, I'm talking before the slides. So we may have to go back to some of the slides. Um, also want to acknowledge how expensive our county is. I think all of us know this. Um, for a, the median income for a family of four is 140,000. For a household of one, it's more than 99,000. Um, last year, the average apartment in San Jose was nearly $2,800, 105% higher than the national average. Um, the mayor in 27 established his goal of building 10,000 new affordable units. Um, but as of the fall of last year, only 245 units had actually been constructed. So we know that there's like a dire need um, for affordable housing. Um, talking a little bit about our clients and who we're seeing, like like I mentioned, it's a it's a the lack of affordable housing is a racial justice issue. We are seeing people of color being displaced from our community. We um, overwhelming number of clients that we served were people of color, um, and nearly 60 percent were women. Since COVID began, we've seen just an uptick in the number of people that we are serving. Um, and we've actually seen an increase in the number of Latinx um, people calling our office. So, you know, over last year, it was about 50% of our callers were, um, were, were Latino. And um, just in the past four months, it's now two thirds of the people who are calling who, um, who are Latino. Nearly half of our um, callers are Spanish speaking and nearly 75% are people of color. And so, you know, when we're talking about like who is at most risk of displacement, we're really talking about people of color, the Latino community that have been that we know have been here for for uh, generations in our in our city and our community. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention about uh, this crisis is we talk a lot about displacement and about you know people, the, you know like the people not being able to afford housing. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about how the impact of, of displacement is not just a housing issue, but it, it, it hits all, uh, all other facets of life and, and things that we care about. Um, you know, when we're talking about uh, unaffordability, nearly half of all county residents are rent burdened um, and black and Latino families are the most hardest hit when, when you're talking about rent burden and uh, spending more than a third of their income of rent um, 30% or three out of 10 are spending more than 50%. Um, if you are displaced, you're more likely to end up in a precarious housing situation that's like living in a hotel, doubling up with friends or family. 20% um, of people who are displaced um, moved into these more precarious housing situations, things like couch search searching or moving into their car, compared to only 4% four, uh, 4 of households have not been displaced. There are health consequences that we know about that studies have shown related to displacement. Um, and that those health outcomes are worse for people who are poor, women, children, and the elderly. Um, vulnerable populations have, sh have shown shorter life expectancy, higher cancer rates, more birth defects, greater infant mortality, infant mortality every single time that they're displaced. Um, there's also data that shows that people are less engaged politically once they've been displaced. Um, people who are displaced were less likely to be willing to take on collective political action in their community, 69% compared to 87% respectively. There's also an impact on children and education. Over a third of children who have been displaced um, had to have changed schools because of moving, and this has a negative effect on academic success. So when we're talking about you know the displacement crisis and you know and you know the commercial linkage fee, it's not we shouldn't just look at this as an issue about you know this is about you know building more housing or this is about like you know whether people can afford to live here. This is really about what kind of community do we want in San Jose? Do we want a vibrant, thriving community where people are healthy, where kids you know are able to do well in school, that people are politically engaged, or do we want to be in a community um, where just only a select few are able to afford to live. 
we really strongly believe a robust commercial linkage fee is, is essential to ensure that we are a city where everyone belongs um, and everyone can stay. So what can you all do? Um, so your voice is powerful and it must be heard. We encourage everyone to uh, tell the mayor, the city council, your neighbors, your friends, tweet about it, put on, face, on Facebook, Instagram, that you know, we need to have a robust commercial linkage fee um, to, in order to build a house, the homes that we and our neighbors need. Um, if we don't demand to be heard, the city will make the rules that govern us. We also um, encourage you all to vote and support candidates that are, are going to support um, affordable housing and rules that, um, and regulations that support the building of affordable housing. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Council Member Perales, who represents District 3. Hello, uh, good um, afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank you to SV at Home for giving me an opportunity to uh, be a part of this important discussion today. Uh, my name is Raul Perales. I am the council representative for District 3, which is uh, the downtown and all the surrounding neighborhoods around downtown here in San Jose. And uh, first off, I actually wanted to be able to provide a little bit of history on the commercial linkage fee uh, in San Jose, because it's actually quite a milestone that we're even where we're at today. And as you heard uh, in uh, Matt's presentation, San Jose is really the last remaining a uh, major city here in uh, the area that has not enacted a commercial linkage fee. And, uh, and really um, the, the majority of the reason for that uh, is been a lack of, or has been a lack of political will. Um, prior to 2015 for several years, uh, the council, uh, a few minority members of the council uh, attempted to prioritize the work on a commercial linkage fee uh, getting this nexus study completed and uh, unfortunately did not get a majority of the council to support that effort. Finally, in 2015, uh, actually the first year that I was on the council as well, um, we were able to vote it in as a council priority, um, but unfortunately uh, we were denied any actual work on it um, and it was not able to move forward um, because of a lot of the reasons that you heard Nadia just speak to in regards to uh, San Jose being more of a bedroom community, wanting to have a focus on driving uh, new office development, uh, which is something that is absolutely true and something that I support. Uh, but at the same time, um, I was one of the, the minority that supported as well, having this commercial linkage fee uh, be added to uh, that new uh, de development, commercial development. And so um, the council over a number of years uh, debated that, uh, over essentially the last five years, right, debated that. Um, and in that meantime, we have seen, as you've now seen described in the, the presentation of the slides, home ownership, uh, right, becoming uh, nearly impossible for many of our, our local families. Uh, the rents continuing to rise. Some people may recall uh, just last year, actually, my wife and I experienced displacement and actually we found it hard um, with a budget of $3,000 to find a two bedroom apartment here in uh, the District 3 area. Uh, I have to reside in the downtown uh, within the district. And uh, it was very difficult to even find something um, under uh, 3000 uh, for two bedroom. Um, and unfortunately, uh, right, as you go to individuals uh, that are not of the same means that my wife and I have, uh, it, it is impossible. Uh, it's not nearly impossible, but it actually becomes impossible. And they not only get displaced um, uh, from maybe the, the area, they're getting displaced from the city altogether. Uh, and we've also seen that San Jose, uh, as Nadia described, is nowhere near reaching our affordable housing goals. Uh, and so now fast forward to um, this year, well, actually two years ago, first off, uh, 2018, when the council uh, actually did finally pass doing the Nexus study. Uh, and unfortunately it has taken us two years, it's taken us till now um, to be able to, to, to see the completion of that study. And um, as Matt pointed out and demonstrated showing some of the, uh, what we knew was already the case, right? We, we knew, uh, the nexus was going to be shown and the numbers were going to be uh, strikingly high uh, given the, the, the cost of housing here in, uh, in San Jose. And that's what we saw, uh, what you saw on the slide that, that Matt put up. Um, and, and so now we actually have an opportunity 
of ensuring um, that, that we can actually get some dollars, some more permanent dollars for creating the housing that we know that we need and the housing that we know this new office development generates an even greater need for. Um, cities all around us, right, have recognized uh, that impact. They've taken that action. Um, they have their commercial linkage fees. Um, we only have the Nexus study, and then we'll have the feasibility study. We don't actually have the commercial linkage fee yet. And so as you've heard described uh, from Nadia, it is important that we continue to hear from the community because uh, there is a possibility that, especially given in the times that we're in, in this pandemic, that the council, uh, at least the majority of the council, may elect not to enact a commercial linkage fee. So we're not over the final hurdles yet, um, and no doubt there will be um, challenging conversations ahead. And so uh, I think it's extremely important that our city follows suit with uh, our neighbors, Milpitas, Santa Clara, Mountain View, as you saw the studies there uh, in the chart on countless other Bay Area cities. Um, that have already enacted a, a commercial linkage fee and that we, we finally enact ours here. Uh, it's certainly, uh, right, as you saw in the slides, um, we remain unaffordable, not just for our current residents, but we remain unaffordable for the majority of our workers. And so as we build these new jobs, uh, these same workers that we're going to be expecting to be employed here are not going to be able to find uh, an apartment or potentially not be able to find a home that they can afford. And uh, I, I won't cover over some of the, the stats uh, that you saw in, in the slides there, uh, but we've certainly seen an increase in uh, where rent has gone uh, just from last year, actually. And, and uh, certainly we've seen a little bit of a slowdown during this pandemic, but um, I don't think anybody should fool themselves that this is going to linger for too long. Uh, the pandemic will itself, but we saw in our last recession, uh, our housing economy uh, was one of the first things to bounce back. Uh, that will be the case again um, as well. And, and in fact, we haven't even seen steep declines even at the moment. Um, for specifically, uh, and, and Nadia described this, but for many of our workers that are in the retail, the food industry, uh, residential care, uh, there's even a higher likelihood, right, that these families are, are having to double up um, to just afford to find uh, a place to live. Uh, and so we know that, that uh, these statistics are predominantly affecting our, uh, our families of color as well, uh, Black and Latino families, as Nadia described, the number of uh, Latino families that are utilizing the services of the Law Foundation. Um, and we know here, specifically in my district, we have the highest number of homeless individuals um, in the city. And per capita throughout the entire county, we have the highest concentration right here uh, in downtown San Jose. Uh, and with all of the efforts um, that we have going on. For, for every one individual we have entering housing right now, three more are being pushed out into the street. The numbers are staggering. They're alarming. We've seen our homeless population uh, grow exponentially. Um, and uh, I think we're going to continue to see that unless we can actually uh, begin to more permanently resolve this problem of uh, affordable housing. And so the need is, is extremely great. Um, our housing staff has uh, consistently stated that they do not have the adequate resources uh, or funding to implement enough new housing. Uh, and they have been supporters along the way for this tool of a commercial linkage fee. I do appreciate their, uh, their efforts along the way to, to help guide these conversations. Uh, and I believe in a, reg a region, a city uh, that has been experiencing such great economic growth uh, over the years, uh, that success, success should also be felt uh, for all of our, our families. Uh, and then lastly, just in regards to, you know, really, I think um, the, the need that we have for a, a commercial linkage fee, um, the commercial linkage fee would be a sustainable model. Uh, this could be an ongoing source. We've had a lot of one-time sources, uh, different tax measures, uh, even them being time limited, um, and a number of them uh, with uncertainty on, on how or how long they may continue and uh, a commercial linkage fee would give us a, uh, a more permanent model, uh, indeed still reliant on development itself. So there's no guarantee on a certain number of dollars, but there is a guarantee of uh, a continued flow of money through the future uh, for something that we, we don't have to continue to maybe go back to our voters uh, at the ballot for. Um, and that having that, that permanent stream of revenue on an annual basis 
uh, really would allow us to, to begin uh, addressing that affordable housing crisis that, that, that we have uh, and add to a lot of the, the individual efforts or maybe some of the short-term efforts that uh, we've put on the ballot or the county has put on the ballot. Uh, and thank you to SV at Home as well for, uh, for your support over the years to get some of those, those dollars passed. Um, for us, certainly we know that, that you know, it's one of the things in, in our city that we, uh, we celebrate is our diversity. Um, and yet uh, at the same time uh, as we celebrate it, uh, we know that it is our communities of color, our families of color um, that are being forced out uh, and that this issue of a lack of affordable housing, this housing crisis um, is disproportionately affecting uh, the diversity, the great diversity that we, that we um, cherish in our community. Uh, and so if we truly do value that, uh, these are ways that the council, that elected officials um, can actually show that, can demonstrate that support uh, for diversity, for equity, uh, by ensuring that we have uh, these dollars put in place uh, with our new commercial development, new development that is coming into uh, the city. And so um, I just uh, you know, appreciate again the, uh, the efforts. Uh, I, will, I will stress some of the timeline as well, I, which you've, you've heard already, um, but uh, we will have our, our council meeting on August 25th, uh, leading up to, to that date though, we'll have our staff releasing their recommendations um, on the 14th, uh, but it's important to hear from, from you all, from our community um, between those dates and, and most importantly on the 25th, as we take up this item to ensure that the community's voice is present um, and that uh, the council does uh, finally enact uh, a commercial linkage fee. And so thank you again uh, to SV at Home for allowing me to uh, participate with you today. Thank you, Councilmember Barrales. So now we're going to go into the Q&A section. Um, so I think we already have a few questions that are marked to answer live already. So let's start with, this is probably an easy one. What is the city's current annual affordable housing production? I think Matthew, maybe you have the answer there. Mute me. There you go. You're on. Okay. You're uh, yeah, so it, the annual production is difficult because the, the, the funding and the, the, the building process comes in waves. Um, but <coughs> over the last five years, uh, we've been averaging about 270 uh, units a year. Um, and that's drawn from our, our annual report on our, uh, our, our progress to meeting Lena goals. Um, I, I think that's a reasonable uh, number to look at. I know that there's a significant pipeline right now that that it was was uh, uh, begun with the the last funding round from the city, and so we expect those numbers to improve some. Um, but even at the end of the eight year period, we expect to to have have built you know less than twenty percent of of what we had originally wanted to uh, and been asked to by the state and that we're going to fall probably halfway, uh, maybe a little bit less towards the 10,000 unit goal. Um, so that's where we stand right now. Great. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, another question we've had come up here is, um, how would the potential timing of an impact fee be applied to the pending Google development? I can jump in here. Um, so in fact, um, we addressed this late last year on the council, knowing that uh, this work in itself, right, was being delayed, but knowing that a lot of the impetus uh, and the reason, right, as to why we finally got uh, movement two years ago uh, was because of the Google project. And so uh, the council made it clear that we did not want to lose the opportunity uh, to apply a commercial linkage fee on that project, as well as other projects that were in the pipeline. And so we made that decision late last year to uh, notice all of the, the developments that were in the pipeline, uh, that the commercial linkage fee would apply to their projects, uh, even though that work had not been complete yet. Uh, and so it will apply to uh, the Google project. If I could just add a, a little bit of detail. First of all, uh, Councilmember, it's, it's been ex 
extraordinarily important that this has been a priority in your office. And this is a great example uh, of the ability to solve problems as they come up, even as the long process unwinds. The fees are not charged until people get their final building permits. So, uh, you know, even the big J Paul project downtown that was recently entitled sort of approved on concept is, is potentially a year away uh, from the date at which they would have to pay the fees. So I think I, it's important to realize that we're, it really is catching stuff that is in process, but is, is a significant numbers of, of years away from actually being uh, up and occupied. Great, thank you. Uh, and I believe I know the answer to this question. I believe the slides will be available on the website after, or actually not the website, we'll send them out in an email. Typically that's our practice around the hacks. So you'll have access to that information afterwards. Okay, another question here. Uh, in terms of cost for development, how much impact would the 50 to 150 square foot CLF have? Uh, I, I can take that. The 50 to $150 a square foot is the maximum fee allowed by law. Um, it, it will not be the fee that is adopted by council. Uh, the average in the county is about $22.50. Um, $150 a square foot would have a significant impact on developing a project. And, and our assumption is that the fee that, that the council will adopt uh, will be one that will allow us to uh, continue to have development move forward, but to capture resources for the affordable housing demand that's created. Okay, we have a question here from someone from Palo Alto asking about how they can, what the elevator pitch is for a commercial linkage fee and what obstacles they might encounter. Now, I believe Palo Alto has a commercial linkage fee, That is that correct? Yes, they do. Uh, they, they actually have a, a very robust commercial fee. Okay, let's see. Another question here. Um, how does Measure E flow into this discussion? I'm happy to chime in. Could. Yeah, so um, Measure E is, is uh, one of the actual, the, the sort of the um, other maybe short-term measures that I was discussing, uh, other opportunities we have taken up here at the city, the county has as well with Measure A a few years ago to try and generate additional monies for affordable housing. Uh, but it uh, does not and it should not uh, play a part in what we decide to do with commercial linkage fee. Uh, those are individual tax measures. We know that we need a tremendous amount of money as uh, was pointed out here in the slides and as Matt just described in the last question, sort of the 50 to $150 range. Um, that, that's showing what sort of the, you know, that, that nexus is and what we would need to actually uh, achieve on a development to, to get enough affordable housing. But what we know is we couldn't impose a number like 150 because then you actually wouldn't get any development. Um, similarly, I mean, as you go down to even the $50 number would be the same case. So we know that we're short. And so whatever nexus, or excuse me, whatever commercial linkage fee we actually do impose, we know it will be short. It won't be uh, sufficient to build out enough affordable housing. It's going to be that ongoing source that we don't currently have. But what it will be is it'll just be uh, working in collaboration next to a number of different measures that we passed, like measure A, measure E. Uh, and, and likely, uh, we may need even more resources uh, to continue as we move forward. Okay, so another question we have here is, is there a specific dollar per, uh, per square foot uh, before the council yet? No, not, not yet. That's what uh, may be coming out uh, today. So, um, and uh, we will have that, that is what we will be discussing um, on the 25th, ultimately, to, to make a decision, uh, hopefully, actually, uh, to make a decision on a dollar amount. But I, I want to be clear, as I was in my comments, um, that it is possible that the council, a majority of the council, chooses not to enact anything, uh, any commercial linkage fee. 
And so, um, so there may be a dollar amount in front of us, but there may be a discussion around uh, nothing, uh, uh, you know, continuing, um, you know, to delay uh, this process as we have for years. Uh, and so uh, any of those options right now are possible. Great. I, could I jump in for just a second? The, the good news and bad news, council member, is that the, uh, the expectation is actually that you're gonna be presented with a range uh, and so th there's no easy answers <laughs> that are going to be coming out um, today that th there's it's still going to be a, a, you know, a complex discussion and, uh, you know, that th there's enough uncertainty um, that, that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're hoping to weigh in, but we know that there will be a lot of input into how to interpret uh, the, the feasibility study and what the recommendations are. So. Okay, let's see. And then this is just an informational point, but what is the city's current annual market rate housing production versus its affordable production? Um, if you go on, I can come back to that one. Sure, it sounds good. Um, okay, in the context of this discussion, how can we address redlining and economic disadvantages that ensued within the context of commercial development? I think personally, it, it helps with the, the policy discussion um, in, in the argument in favor of a commercial linkage fee, the argument in favor of uh, creating more affordable housing. Um, so I think it helps in that regard. Um, additionally, I think that conversation can help as we start beyond this. Let's say that we do approve a commercial linkage fee and we're beginning to cite more of these affordable housing developments, that's where I think the redlining uh, discussion actually can, can even uh, come into play more so uh, because there are still a lot of places throughout our city uh, that lack uh, any affordable housing whatsoever. And if you go back historically, um, these are a lot of the places that um, you know, individuals of color, people of color were excluded from um, owning a home in uh, and, or, or even, uh, you know, potentially uh, renting in um, because they didn't build any, any affordable housing. And so that, you know, I think it could play a part in, in, uh, in both the, the conversation around approving commercial linkage fee, but then additionally ongoing afterwards. Uh, just to also add uh, to the points that were made, I think, um, I think what the unaffordable housing crisis has done is created de facto segregation in our city and our community because there are only certain places where low-income families can live and that's the majority of people of color. Like if you actually look at like the section eight data in terms of like where you can move to with the section eight voucher, it's really just a few communities in the east side and then some places in South County. And so um, I, like we have, like all of our housing policy, it, it's all connected to what, what to redlining and what's happened in the past. And so I think it's, really important for us as housing advocates to continue to, to um, talk about it in our, in, when we talk about housing policy. Yes, definitely. We have a direct count question here for Councilmember Perales. Uh, what will you, Councilmember Perales, do to prevent the eviction apocalypse that Working Partnerships warned about? Yeah, I think we, we've been discussing this on the council already because uh, when we put in place uh, the eviction moratorium and then have been discussing timelines for repayment, I mean, initially, I think the hope was, you know, okay, is this only going to be a few months? And then the reality is kind of struck that, okay, looks like this is going to be a, a lot longer um, uh, of a pandemic and a lot longer of individuals, excuse me, not being able to pay their rent. And so, um, so we have already stretched that out, and I think that that's where the conversation needs to continue, which is, uh, is that something that we want to eliminate altogether, right, that, that individuals that have not been able to afford their rent, um, certainly there's efforts in that regard in trying to get uh, landlords paid, um, right, that, that are going to go without a, a payment for many, many months, uh, but that's the reality of where the conversation needs to continue to go. Right now, we have um, given an opportunity for people to be able to, to pay back that rent over a period of time after the eviction moratorium ends. But what was highlighted in uh, the article there uh, discusses that after that, after that elongated period is over, 
there's a high likelihood uh, that the majority of those individuals will not have been able to pay their rent back. Uh, and then ultimately, obviously what that means is they'll be displaced. Um, I know the question was uh, for Council Member Farrellis, but if I could just jump in, if you all haven't seen the report, it's, um, you can go to either Working Partnerships website or the Law Foundation's website. We um, estimate that 43,000 families are at risk of eviction in our county um, because of loss of income related to COVID. Um, and, uh, you know, like this, this is something that I worry about every single day. Um, we just heard that the Judici Judicial Council will probably rescind its rule um, mid-August. And so even though there are these, uh, you know, the, the, the moratoriums are strong and there is a, a longer timeline for people to pay them back, like strong laws need strong enforcement. And, and unfortunately we don't have, um, most tenants in our county are not represented. And so that's why we, we want, we, we, we want and we are, we're hoping that the county extends and strengthens and the city extends and strengthens the moratorium um, as well as uh, you know, providing some support to legal services. And, and our, our goal right now is to establish some kind of housing collaborative court that would bring volunteer and other legal resources as well as rent assistance into the actual courtroom to prevent evictions. Yeah, Nadia brings up a great point that even when we put some of these uh, protections, these laws in place, um, that uh, individual, you know, there may be individual uh, property owners out there that don't necessarily care to follow them. And if their tenants don't have the know-how, um, the, the, you know, financial wherewithal, you know, whatever it may be, for whatever reason, if they don't fight it, um, then they just may be subject to being evicted and, and, and move along. And, and, and in fact, we have a good number of our community members that fall into that bracket where they don't challenge this. And as Nadi pointed out that you look at the number of individuals that utilize their services um, and they know that that's just a fraction of people that need this service. Uh, there's a lot of individuals out there that are getting taken advantage of, unfortunately. Um, and so it isn't enough to just have uh, laws to protect uh, our, our tenants. Uh, we have to be able to offer them an ability to to utilize legal legal services to to um, to fight potentially unlawful evictions. This is going to get harder before it gets easier. Okay. Well, let, let's circle around back to that previous question about the annual market rate housing versus affordable production. We had those so numbers. So just a little bit of context, we know that we are not building enough housing of all types to respond to the demand that we have in the city. We, we are doing a much better job of building market rate housing, but it's, it's not good enough. We're behind, uh, you know, the, as the, the council member and Nadia pointed out, we, it, it's expensive. Part of that is a supply and demand issue. So the, the city has been averaging um, about 2,700 market rate units a year over the last five years um, and is on course to reach 151%. So, you know, reaching and then half again, uh, the, the regional housing needs assessment goals that were set uh, by the state. Um, we don't know that that's the best metric. We think we need to be building more housing, but we're definitely doing a better job of building market rate housing uh, than we are of affordable housing. Um, and so Mindy on my team is telling me, oh, sorry, Matt, Mindy on my team is telling me about 70% uh, actually of our goal of market rate is what we're meeting right now. Um, yeah. Versus yeah. about 7%, right, of our, of our uh, affordable. So just... Uh, uh, Extremely disproportionate in, in how we're- Yeah, we're no, I, I apologize for the, the, uh, the, the expectation is at the end of the cycle, which is at 2023, that we're on track to meet about 151% of the goal. Right now we are, uh, we are below that. Um, and you're correct, we're at, we're at you know, seven, 10% for the lower end of the scale. Great. I think we answered another question here we had about the uh, arena goals for above market, uh, above moderate income housing. Um, another question we have here is uh, sort of a different tack. Reducing or eliminating commercial space requirements for affordable housing development could also increase feasibility for more housing. And is that being considered by council? 
Yes. So, um, in fact, uh, that's where we do uh, create some wiggle room for uh, commercial or commercial requirements is in uh, affordable housing, permanent supportive housing. Uh, we will we will waive uh, those requirements or lessen those requirements of the commercial component. In certain parts of the city, though, where we do have uh, an interest to not um, sort of uh, do away with a commercial, say, ground floor, uh, especially in our urban villages, uh, we will still try to, to work with uh, an affordable housing developer to create that uh, vibrant ground floor space. It may not be the same requirement we would have for another development in urban village. It may be four floors worth of commercial, uh, but we will still be looking to create uh, vibrant communities. Um, and, and I think that's important, right? It's You don't want to necessarily neglect that as well, even with uh, affordable developments. Um, it's important that they also have, right, uh, the robust commercial developments around them, the grocery stores, the coffee shops and whatnot, um, and not just a uh, hundred percent affordable housing uh, in particular areas. Great. All right. That's our last question we have here. So thank you very much to everyone who's joined us. What we're going to do now is we're going to have my uh, associate Mario Lopez on the SV at Home team, the Action Fund, will share the timeline and the uh, opportunities to engage and support the uh, commercial linkage fee in San Jose. So, uh, Mario? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mitch, uh, for that. So what we're going to be talking about um, is the campaign timeline. I think that Council Member Perales and some of our other feature speakers has have already mentioned this uh, throughout the presentation. But um, as everyone knows, uh, last week we had the, um, the city release the Nexus study Today we're scheduled to uh, hopefully uh, see the feasibility study. And then the next big uh, point of engagement for us is gonna be the public meeting that the city is gonna be hosting on August 6th. And then um, as council member Perales mentioned, staff recommendations are uh, currently scheduled to be released on Friday, August 14th uh, with council uh, deliberating uh, the commercial linkage fee uh, at its uh, Tuesday, August 25th meeting. And so this is a timeline that we're going to um, uh, continue to work with. Uh, and these are going to be the next points of uh, level of engagement. So we really want folks to be able to get involved. Um, once we have the link from the city in terms of the public meeting and how to be able to participate virtually for it, we'll go ahead and send it out to the registrants of this uh, webinar, as well as promote it through our uh, various means of uh, social media communications. Um, and so the, the public meeting is essentially soliciting input from the community uh, that will inform staff recommendations to city council. And so that's going to be the first major public uh, or a way to get involved with the campaign. The second one would be uh, letters of support. Uh, so as I mentioned, city staff is scheduled to release their recommendations to city council on Friday, August 14th. And then we're going to be circulating a letter of support uh, as well as an online uh, take action petition that everyone can uh, participate in and um, contact their respective council members. And then lastly, and more importantly, we really do invite the members of the public to join us on Tuesday, August 25th for mm -hmm. um, uh, the council meeting when it's actually going to be uh, uh, deliberated. And so, you know, we'll be providing some talking points for folks to be able to feel comfortable enough mm -hmm. uh, to speak about this particular issue um, mm -hmm. in advance of the meeting. And so uh, watch out for another email for, from us with those details as well. And then lastly, and more importantly, if you want to do something in between these uh, specific dates, um, this is another way for you to get involved is to follow us on social media and use the hashtag pass the fee SJ. We really want to be able to elevate this as much as possible. These are some of our social media handles that we have uh, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, we're very excited to continue to be able to promote this as much as possible. And in the in coming weeks, we're going to also be uh, rolling out our video project highlighting the, the housing crisis and the impact it has had on residents within the city of San Jose. And so we're very excited. We're looking forward to uh, passing the fee here in San Jose. Uh, and we welcome you all to be a part of this conversation as well. <clears throat> And then just want to thank everybody uh, 
want to thank our speakers. If you want to get involved a little bit more or get additional questions answered that we weren't able to get to as of right now, this is the contact information for, for the folks that spoke. Uh, Matthew Reed, uh, thank you so much. Nadia Aziz uh, from the La Foundation for joining us this afternoon, as well as Councilman Morrell Palos for joining us um, and sharing us what the context of the, the commercial linkage fee within the city of San Jose. So Mitch, do you want to close us out? Sure. sure. Thank you to a few, uh, a few more resources. Uh, I just linked the eviction time bomb report that uh, was mentioned earlier in the chat, as well as the link for next month's hack, which will focus on schools and communities first, which is another source of revenue for, well, many, many programs, not just housing. Um, and I also have a question here about which social media to follow. I think that was answered, but uh, I can get some links to our SU at Home social media in the chat there. And with that, I just wanna thank everyone for coming. Uh, we do this every month, so we really appreciate you joining us uh, and see you next time. We'll stay on a couple, a little bit longer so that you can uh, copy the links if you like. Uh, but then we'll be closing out. Thank you very much. I'll also note that we, um, we have this live on Facebook. So if you're looking for a recording that we posted immediately, you can find it there on our Facebook page. I'll actually send the link if I can now uh, in the chat here. And then we'll also post it to our YouTube channel as well. Um, and I think next month we'll actually have some live streaming there as well. So that's a good place to also follow us. I'll get a link for that as well. And for those of us watching on the Facebook Live, uh, I'll put these links in the chat after we're done, since we'll have access to that at that time. I should also mention for anyone who's still here that you can find a lot of information on our mailing list. So I will drop a link to the to be able to sign up for that as well. Uh, and if the person is still on, the date of next month's webinar is August 28th. All right. Thanks very much. Bye.